okay? Can you hear me okay? You guys hear me? Yeah, there we are. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm James Glasscock. I'm from Reserve Protocol. I head ecosystem. Uh, before we kick off, I'm going to show you a video. It's about 90 seconds, so enjoy. If we have the video, ready to queue up. I just want to settle for once and for all the point that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. They ran out of money and they needed more, so they printed more, a lot more. The prices go up for almost everybody in almost every country. This happens every year, every decade, every century. The prices just keep going up. But what if that's not how money worked? What if your purchasing power could stay the same through time? Hi, you're meeting the Reserve Project. We want a world of asset-backed currency. We want a world where your wealth is stored across a diverse range of tokenized assets. An asset-backed currency built on the Reserve Protocol is called an R token, and it runs on smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. Every R token that gets minted is backed by the appropriate basket of assets. Rpay is an app for Android and iOS. Today, all balances in Rpay are in US dollars. Since the only stable coin you can hold with it right now is RSV, and RSV is pegged to the US dollar. Can you actually create a currency that doesn't inflate, that doesn't have this problem of price inflation? We think that the answer is maybe yes. I wanted to show you that so you could get a sense of where we're coming from. Uh, this presentation is not about reserve protocol, though. It's about a different topic. It's about something that I've been calling the long tail of stable coins. But um, I think it's helpful to see kind of a little bit of background uh, on where we're coming from, and, and maybe at the end I'll just talk a little bit about reserve. So before we begin, you can scan the QR code. Uh, the deck is available. You can copy the deck, fork it, do whatever you'd like to do with it. Um, you can dive into the Discord and connect with people in the reserve community if you'd like to do that as well. Uh, I'm James Glasscock. I'm head of ecosystem at reserve. And um, let's see. Uh, Reserve's mission is to increase adoption of and expand access to sustainable inflation-proof uh, currency around the world. Um, I should probably use the clicker. <laughs> okay, what is a long tail? Uh, long tail represents the significant demand for niche products that emerge in the digital age of online markets. Uh, the y-axis is popularity and the x-axis is the number of products. Uh, before the digital revolution of the 90s, most industries were relegated to only making hits in order to survive. Everything was driven by gatekeepers. The long tail was also a essay in 20, 2004, and it became a book in 2006 uh, by a guy named Chris Anderson. He was the editor of Wired Magazine at the time, and you might be familiar with some of his other products. He invented or created TED Talks. Whoops, see if we get, oh, okay. Moving. All right, uh, long tail markets have different expansion stages. The first stage is they democratize the tools of production. So more stuff lengthens the tail. The second stage is they democratize the tools of distribution. Uh, more access flattens the tail. And the third stage is uh, they connect supply and demand, uh, which drives business from hits to niche. Now, I keep saying they, but who am I talking about? Well, um, <clears throat> in Web 1 and 2, it's centralized corporations, but uh, in the next generation, Internet of Ownership and Value, some, some call it Web3, the they is us or we. Open source and composability is a force multiplier for the long tail. Let's dive in. There's already 100 plus stable coins in existence. 
This is Vitalik's stablecoin categorization. He published an essay in December uh, where he talked about the things that he was excited about in the Ethereum ecosystem. It's a really cool framework. He dives into the three categories. First category being centralized. Second category, DAO-governed, real-world uh, asset-backed. And the third category being governance-minimized, crypto asset-backed. Um, centralized stablecoins today make up over 95% of the market share. But um, dare I be cliche and say, it's really early. When I think about the long tail of stable coins, why would there be, why do we need more than one? <clears throat> and what we're already seeing is there are lots of different jobs to be done. These are 10 of the very popular stable coins today. Uh, they each have different jobs to be done. Tether was the first. It provided a safe haven for traders and it was bootstrapped by Bitfinex. Um, USDC, very similar, came along a few years later, more regulatory um, transparent, um, also bootstrapped by Poloniex and Coinbase at the time. Uh, Frax is an uh, on-chain hedge fund for DeFi maxis. Um, AlUSD, the one at the bottom, is a pretty cool bridge stablecoin for people accessing uh, self-repaying loans. Different jobs to be done. <clears throat> How did we get here? So the tyranny of physical space. It's, uh, you can kind of feel it just by looking at the image, right? Um, it's self-explanatory, but uh, it's not very fair. And sometimes it becomes the basis for war. People fight over space, they fight over land, they fight over assets. But this is an industrial age paradigm. Old days were less fair. Um, prior to the printing press in 1440, knowledge and history were controlled by monks and scribes, accessible to a few. Prior to 1994, <clears throat> when the commercial internet started to blossom, everything was available for free in the yellow pages. Actually, it wasn't everything. It was just for a few things that passed the gatekeepers. And ultimately, it wasn't free either. Prior to 2008, <clears throat> pre-Bitcoin, we only had the fiat standard at scale. And the 99% get rugged. It's still happening today. Fiat money is not working for the everyman. Um, the green line is the purchasing power of the US dollar. <clears throat> the red line is US government debt, which is now just above $31 trillion in the United States. Today's dollar bought about four times more in the 80s and about eight times more in the 70s. Everywhere. This is the same chart you saw in the video. This is... <clears throat> inflation across 30 countries since 1960. Right now, there's about five countries worldwide with an inflation rate greater than 100%, and 23 countries exceeding 20%. The cost of sending a $200 international remittance can be as high as eight to $34, depending on the corridor. Getting credit may depend on the gray markets and sometimes results in unfair loans, data theft, harassment, and physical harm. The need for safe, stable currency has never been more important. So, how do we create stable and fair currencies that retain their value indefinitely? We need to run a lot of experiments, and not all of them are going to succeed. There's something we can learn from other industries, though. Other industries that adopted digital production and distribution and connected supply and demand uh, thanks to those technologies. <clears throat> What's about to happen in uh, digital money has already happened in other industries. We'll take a look at shopping, broadcasting, and mobile apps. Shopping. Um, this is uh, 1980s. We mostly congregated in malls with a limited number of stores and products that, again, were approved by the gatekeepers. This is the tyranny of physical space. 
Today, there are over one million merchants on the Shopify platform alone. Broadcasting. In the 1980s, launching a broadcast channel cost tens of millions of dollars. <clears throat> Took years to launch. Today, anyone can do it for free in just a few minutes. I can tell you, in 2005, I was at Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta, Georgia, and being the kind of incumbent uh, uh, gatekeeper, they laughed at YouTube. I was there. Um, YouTube was not considered anything to be serious. Uh, now YouTube is a far larger business than Turner Broadcasting. Mobile apps. <clears throat> the OG phone app was talking on the phone. Then we got SMS texting, and now there's over two million apps in the app store. What do you think happens when we get a true Web3 app store at scale? So in all of those three examples, what happened? Well, it's free tools, creativity, infinite distribution, and incentives. Does it sound familiar? It's already happening in the Ethereum ecosystem. Remember those long tail market ex uh, expansion stages uh, earlier in the slides? I think it was slide four. Democratize tools of production, democratize the tools of distribution, and connect supply and demand. What is especially unique this time, though, <clears throat> is decentralization and composability which is a really powerful force for expansion to occur faster than we've ever seen in history. Okay, back to money. The applications of industrial age money are fairly basic. They're ingrained in our lives, just like fax machines were 30 years ago and horses were 100 years ago. Whoa. Digital age money, though, provide something new, expressive program programmability. There are a lot of different ways to sort of frame this. Uh, this was the one I chose when I made the slide. But in the digital age, programmability changes everything. Dilemmas and trilemmas for sure get more complex. It depends on what you want to prioritize. <clears throat> it depends on what the specific job is to be done. Take, for example, branding in the bottom right one you might think is the least important on this slide. But <clears throat> the US dollar is a brand. It's actually one of the greatest memes in history. Some of the folks in this room are Ethereans. Maybe some are Bitcoiners. Maybe there's even some lunatics left. <clears throat> Delta Sky Miles, that's the brand of their money. Roblox has branded their money Robux. Um, the casinos in Monaco started branding their money hundreds of years ago, not for fun, but to make it easier to use and to prevent counterfeiting. It's actually a really important part of a thriving ecosystem. Everything on this slide offers different utility that might be important to each of you in a different way. Some may value privacy, some may value speed. Um, this list is not exhaustive either. This is just what I came up with to get on one slide. Some of you will come up with things entirely different. You can also do mashups. You can start to program the money uh, to create whatever your specific use case is for. Um, the asset backing for the money is customizable too. I'll talk a little bit more about reserve at the end, but you can build an asset-backed currency on-chain with any ERC-20 token. Today, people are using fiat stablecoins, uh, fiat stablecoins with exposures to US Treasury bills. Uh, folks are looking at using um, <coughs> gold assets. We've already seen a... Uh, an, ass, uh, an asset basket of um, liquid staking derivatives. Uh, really, the opportunities are endless, and we're starting to see real-world asset tokenization tick up considerably. I think at the beginning of the year, it was around three or four hundred million dollars worth. Now it's double that, and uh, we're really excited about what the possibilities of all these assets coming on chain will enable. <clears throat> 
This cube is uh, kind of a <clears throat> just a depiction of what you could put in a basket. You've got some dye, some true USD, some uh, USDC, some three pool from Curve, uh, even a Frax base pool with Al USD. Again, it's completely up to your creativity. Just like what we've seen in those other industries and the internet for the last 25 years. Lots of things have been created that folks couldn't really fathom in 1995. <clears throat> if history is a teacher, stable coins are just beginning. Um, when Google launched in 1998, there were already 18 search engines. Most people thought search engines were kind of done, complete. Uh, then came Google. If you're familiar with uh, 1990s internet history, uh, you'll appreciate that America Online, which was one of the first internet serv service providers, AOL, uh, was one of the first tech unicorns. It was the darling of uh, Wall Street and the digital economy in the United States. It's gone now, for the most part. <clears throat> we are right now in the AOL era of stable coins. The long tail, a long tail of stablecoins may be the future, each with different jobs to be done. But remember, the long tail looks to be niche initially, but similarly, Tesla was niche when it launched, 2003. Facebook was niche when it launched, 2004. The US dollar was niche when it launched in 1785. This is how paradigms shift, whether in transportation or communications or even in money. So <clears throat> here's a sampling of what's new already in 2023. We're now six months into it. Um, this is just 10 of, 10 of them. Uh, Curve USD launched a few weeks ago, really exciting product. It offers a more friendly, soft liquidation engine for borrowers, a specific job to be done. High USD, high yield USD. It's an on-chain DeFi savings account with up to 8% APY. Everything's on chain, asset backing on chain, over collateralization on chain, um, proof of reserves on chain. Third one, uh, let's see, USD Glow, second from the bottom, I'm sorry. This is a cool one. It's a charity dollar that donates T-bill yield to help end poverty. This is really exciting, because now we're talking about moving money from, again, this industrial age paradigm to uh, something that's more regenerative and more productive for society. Like I said, innovation requires running experiments, and not all will su succeed. OK, who might deploy or utilize these stable coins in the future? It's a lot of folks. Um, short answer is maybe a lot more than we think. <clears throat> Each of these groups has a different motivation, a different job to be done. Already inside of Reserve, we're seeing engagement. We've, we've seen a protocol uh, deploy uh, one of these asset-backed currencies, the electronic dollar. We've seen entrepreneurs de uh, deploy uh, an ETH liquid staking basket and the high USD that I talked about on the prior slide. You might see DAOs do this. You might see rewards programs decide to bring their point systems into a on-chain environment um, and actually <clears throat> not inflate their uh, currency, uh, which is uh, a problem that's plaguing the industry right now. You might see banks, video games, and metaverses um, uh, launch their own stable currencies. From what I can tell, um, there's lots of talk about currency systems within video games and metaverses. I can't find a good rationale for why those currencies should be volatile, um, especially now that tools exist where you can have a stable currency uh, that can uh, provide uh, ecosystem yield for whoever's launching it. Um, so that's really exciting. And then network states and governments. <clears throat> These groups are not all gonna jump in at the same time. This list is kind of more or less prioritized in how I think it'll play out. So, let's see. QR code again, scan it if you'd like. Uh, join us in the reserve discord if you'd like to talk more about this. 
Uh, again, the deck is available on the QR code as well. And uh, just a quick glance, these are the three that have already been created on the reserve protocol this year. Uh, all the buttons in the deck are active, so if you get the deck, you can click through and learn how to mint them, trade them, LP them, uh, or stake uh, within the community. Who has questions? Yes. Here we go. Anybody have questions about the long tail of stable coins? Hi, oh, here. So uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk. I wonder how you think about uh, the kind of domination of the US dollar in this space. It seems that most people still think in US dollars, no, no matter where they live, no matter if they are very long on Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatnot, they still uh, seem to very much rely on the US dollar. And then this comes with a lot of centralization baggage because you need to take this price of something in US dollars, put it on chain, and then do something with it. Thanks. Yep, it's a great question. So the question is um, about the US dollar as being the reference point for a lot of stable coins. It's uh, obviously a very dominant influence right now on most stable coins, but you've all been hearing increasingly about flat coins, um, which is, I think it was a term coined by Balaji uh, several years ago, a flat coin is generally stable but not pegged to any type of fiat currency. Uh, it could be pegged to the net asset value of its basket. It could be pegged to an inflation rate. Uh, I'm sure some folks will come along in the future and have better definitions of flat coins. But um, the way I think about it is, and there's a lot of kind of um, different points of view about this, uh, especially if you're on crypto, Twitter, uh, about uh, the dollar losing its network effects or gaining its network effects. Uh, I think in the long run, uh, you know, I just wrote a, a piece a few weeks back called Money Different. You can find it on the Reserve blog. And I kind of uh, reframe how Ray Dalio has talked about empire currencies in history. They don't last forever. Uh, there's been, he gives, I think, eight examples in his book. Um, I think the Dutch Gilder, the British Pound, the US dollar, the Roman denarius, uh, and a few others. Um, so what I would say is what's cool about something like the Reserve Protocol or maybe some other projects out there, you know, Olympus Dow has Ohm, which is essentially a flat coin. Uh, I believe uh, the folks from Truflation have launched Nuon, which is also a flat coin pegged to a, a CPI index. Frax has the FPI um, uh, stable coin that's pegged to the uh, American Inflation Index. Uh, and then High USD is uh, <clears throat> just a yield bearing, uh, uh, adds a percentage of yield every year. Um, so, I'm actually excited to see what people will create next. You know, uh, thus far, dollar peg stable coins have been um, really a, a network effect multiplier for the United States, but at the same time, uh, lots of folks are also leaving the United States to go innovate elsewhere. Um, so it will, we'll have to see how that changes, but I would expect in 100 years, um, this question will be answered. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, great. What are your thoughts on algorithmic stable coins, slowly or fractionally collapsed? Yeah, so the question is about uh, what do I think about algorithmic stable coins, either fully or, or fractionally blocked? Um, our founder, uh, Nevin, uh, did a talk a few years ago, um, talking, and he wrote a very lengthy paper on a project called Basis Protocol. It was a project that raised a lot of capital and ultimately decided not to launch. But it was a very deep dive analytical assessment of why the protocol would not maintain its peg. Um, and, and Nevin went on to sort of talk about that on a few uh, panel discussions, um, even warning folks about Terra Luna. So um, we have a lot of concerns about it. Um, and that's why the reserve protocol, in fact, early on, they evaluated lots of different algorithmic models and ultimately settled on something that would be one-to-one asset-backed always 
and over collateralized. So I think you know, our feeling on it is that it was not the right path for reserve. There were a lot of concerns around it. That being said, I'm intrigued to study all of the models out there uh, that are doing it with uh, fractional uh, or uh, some, torp some type of algorithmic uh, mechanism. Um, also, I should just say algorithmic is a really broad word. Uh, can mean lots of things, lots of things get put into the bu bucket, but I think kind of mostly what we think about with algorithmic is we're talking about something that might not be backed by exogenous assets. Uh, that's how I think about it. Uh, exogenous assets being assets from outside of your protocol versus endogenous, which was really the fatal flaw, one of the fatal flaws of Terra Luna. It was backed by its own governance tokens. Can't really build a stable coin very well with that. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think about, let's say, the next five years? Would we see more adoption of other fiat-backed stable coins, which are not US dollar backed, or more flat coins that you mentioned? Yeah, the question is, uh, what will happen in the next five years? Will we see more uh, fiat-backed stable coins, like the dollar, or maybe the euro? Um, or will we see flat coins? Um, my short answer is I don't know. I'm kind of more excited, though, about the flat coin opportunity, about the experimentation. It's really the reason why I wanted to come here and talk today, because these, what's, re what's really cool when you have a permissionless platform for people to create on, we're seeing it right now, right? YouTube, I gave you, I mentioned the YouTube story when I was at Turner Broadcasting uh, 18 years ago. Now there's just 37 million creators on YouTube. They create more content, get more viewing than any other platform on earth. Um, the App Store example I used also, two million apps in the App Store. You can go on and on looking at digital platforms and the impact. Now, I don't think there's going to be two million stable coins, but you know, Lots of people in 1995 didn't know what 2005 would bring. And I just, I'll just i mention one more thing on this. In 1999, <clears throat> a lot of folks thought Amazon uh, was a fraud. They thought, oh, this is going to die. This business is not going to work. Um, and, uh, and in 2000, when the dot-com bubble burst, it went from like $80 a share down to $0.80. Cents, and people did kind of the victory laps that told you so, Amazon's not going to work, it's going to die. And a lot of people were really skeptical about the internet still in 2000, 2001. It wasn't really until about 2004 and five when we got like Netflix streaming and Facebook that people recognized this is really here to stay. Um, and so I just share that because that's, I think right now we are like in the 1993 or 94 internet with crypto. That's how early this is. It's, uh, it's exciting and it's frustrating at the same time. Do I have time for one more question? No, I do not. All right. Thank you so much. I'll be around. So.